My name is Michael Stern. I'll just give you a quick bio. So we have a lot of material to cover in a very short period of time. Bio is Long Island, five towns, country club, Christmas trees, Santa Claus, basketball jock, University of Maryland, management consulting, and I started my Jewish journey at 29. And I went to Asia Torah for seven years, and I started Asia Torah, helped to start Asia Torah Philadelphia in Balakin with Loa Marion. Then I worked for Rabbi Michal Tversky and uh, Pinchas Avrich over here. <laughs> Had to fit you in there. For five years, and then uh, I was the uh, first uh, Orthodox Kiruv rabbi for a J Jewish community center in the country in Boca Raton. Mm. And now I'm a, a rabbi in Yardley, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour, 20 minutes away from here. That's where I'm coming from. Now, I, one caveat before we start, it's a lot of material, and because of the nature of the subject, there's a lot of stream of consciousness in here. So it may not be as neatly packaged as your normal shear, where everything is very clear along the way, but it comes all from my heart. So on April 14th in 2013, my wife and I noticed that our daughter Shoshi was not back at home. And it was very late, it was uncharacteristically, it was uncharacteristic of her. And my wife was, was also uncharacteristically concerned. Our girls are very independent, they're responsible, they're smart, their feet on the ground. So if she wasn't home on time, we started being concerned. And Denise was readying herself to go out. We said, maybe check the dog park. I don't know, maybe God forbid some masher pull her, pulled her into the bushes. I don't know. At that time, that was the worst thing we were thinking about. But I think the fact that Denise went out, she kind of knew that something was not right. And I, I felt a sense of dread. And an angel must have taken Denise on a circuitous route because it took time for Denise to get to the roped off scene with the police cars. A lot of drivers came out of their cars. And the policeman asked, what are you looking for? And he said, my, my daughter, she's lost. And the policeman took Denise over to the side and showed her show she's skateboard and asked her, is this your daughter's? And then the moment of unspeakable dread came to my wife and uh, showed she was struck by a driver crossing Palmetto Parkway in Boca Raton on a skateboard. And uh, according to numerous reports, thank God she died instantly. One has exactly seven seconds to cross that six lane highway along with two passing lanes. And it's not a situation that the community, it had not gone unnoticed. It's just that nobody is particularly impacted enough to do something about it. But it, there's a thousand families on both sides of this highway. And even up until today, they haven't done anything yet. And it's just like a, it's another accident waiting to happen, God forbid. What do you say when the policeman comes with your wife and there's no words and you know what happens? You think, what are you going to say to your wife? Or what are you going to say? What are you going to say to your children? What are you going to say to yourself? We're completely lost. Lost. And life as we had known it was gone forever. So tonight I'd like to share some thoughts with you as to what lessons, some of the lessons we learned from Shoshis Batira, and how these lessons were gleaned amongst the terrifying darkness. And then perhaps something that we learned from it, somebody who's living in darkness themselves can learn and feel inspired and be able to cope and grow within the darkness. So tonight's topic is finding light within the darkness. To find the light that we are all seeking, we first need to identify and be real with the darkness. To feel the darkness. Because it's within the darkness itself that we will find the light. And if we want to, we will necessarily propel ourselves to find that light. 
Just like in Bedikas Chametz, we turn off all the lights so that the light of the candle is so bright and we can seek with it. We can see with it best. But we make sure it's dark first. Thank God, for many of us, it's not easy to find and see and feel the darkness for any sustained period of time. We experience it for a moment and then our normal, average, everyday, mundane life sets back in. And that is the way the Almighty designed it for us. But you know, sometimes you hear about another person's tragedy. You're like, oi, you empathize, you say a little Tehillim, a little prayer on their behalf. But then you get quickly back to your life. Sometimes it hits closer to home, somebody you know. You know very well, you share their misery, their heartbreak, you sit, you talk, have coffee, you share. But you get back to your life, just real quick. That's normal. Sometimes you're touched by the calamity in the world. You hear something about ISIS, beheadings, poverty and war and hunger. But if it doesn't touch us personally, we go right back. And thank God, Hashem doesn't seem to really make us or expect us to live with the reality of reality for any sustained period of time. Normal life, I would say, I call it a mundane curtain. It's a mundane curtain that we live at. We often don't see behind unless there's a transcendental event of some kind. It could be one of joy incredible beauty, incredible awe, perfection, but on the other side it could be tragedy and challenge. But that's on the side of the transcendental. That's going behind the curtain, beyond the curtain. And when we touch that transcendental, it's not very long. We're back on the other side of our normal, mundane life. And if we did live in the reality all the time to see all the pain, the true pain and misery that exists beyond the curtain, we lived with that, we'd be paralyzed. In Torah Judaism, it's called true yira. If you had true seeing what life or reality was all about, we couldn't take a step. We couldn't walk in the world. We'd be paralyzed from the fear. We'd be overwhelmed by the pain of this world. Then there are some people here, including myself, who have had personal challenges or a tragedy that have had our mundane lives altered forever. And every second of how we think and we talk and we experience the world, there is no normal anymore the way it was normal before. And for that kind of person, it's a little easier to feel a little real, to be real with the darkness. But the question I want to explore tonight is, how do we deal with the darkness for ourselves, each other, the Jewish people? How do we find the light? So there we were, we were sitting Shiva, and everybody was comforting us that we should be amongst the mourners of Zion and Yerushalayim, Zion and Jerusalem. There's a, a standard thing that you say to comfort a mourner, and it's pretty rote. It's pretty mechanical. Amakom, you know, you're sitting there as the mourner, like, okay, you know, you know, let me get up there and say it for them. Okay, I can't. You know, it's. But what can we do? That's what Chazal tells us to do. But it felt so hollow. It felt, I'm here in tremendous pain and misery, and the words mean nothing. And I was thinking about it. Who are these mourners of Sion and Yerushalayim? Who are they? It wasn't clear, and I had to think about it a lot. I'd like to know who the mourners are and what they've been doing up until now. Do you know who the mourners of Zion and Yushalayim are? Where are they? So I started thinking about the last 25 years of my Judaism journey. I was like, yeah, of course. 
the mourners of Tzion and Shalayim. It's all over the place. In fact, the more you look, the every, it's everywhere. And I had been experiencing my own Tisha B'Av. Like the original Tisha B'Av. And I can imagine it. Our poor people besieged by the Romans. Slaughtered. Slaughtered us. Starved us. Because this is how I felt inside. Bereft of the lives that we were living. It's not some story with the Romans. It's happened to our people. Bereft of the loved ones. Bereft of anything they knew that was normal totally gone. And I can see our people, the mourners of Sion and Shalayim, in sackcloth, mourning the loss of their loved ones while a temple burns. Between the 17th of Tammuz, the destruction of the temples, our people, these are the dates where our people experience the most devastating losses we ever have. May you be comforted amongst the mourners of Sion and Yerushalayim. And finally, I was like, I am them. They are me. I am a mourner of Sion and Yerushalayim. And I started noticing everywhere in Jewish life that not only was I indeed a mourner of Sion and Yerushalayim, but I always was, but I didn't know it. I was just catching up to the reality. And the same thing here. You're all mourners of Zion and Yerushalayim. It's only to the extent that we wake up to the reality that that is what our matzav is. And we say Birkas Amazon so every day when Hashem will return the captivity of Zion. That means Zion is captured. What we have in Israel today, it's not Zion. It's not the Zion we're waiting for. May our eyes behold your return to Zion in compassion. Blessed are you, Hashem, who restores his presence in Zion. We are mourning for the lack of Hashem's presence in the world. A goel, a redeemer, shall come to Zion, to Zion. Hayinu kechomim. It says in Shira Malos, the benching, we will be like dreamers. When Zion is finally redeemed by Mashiach, only then we'll have the shlemis coming from an understanding and an awareness and a knowledge of God's dominion and presence in our lives. And only then will life be truly normal. But until then, there is no real normal. It's just an illusion. And the illusion of every day's normal, which is really abnormal, while we seek the normal of times of Mashiach, the only, one of the only ways, unfortunately, and it is such a weird thing to say, but one of the ways to break through the mundane curtain, the normalness that we relate to as being normal in this world, is through challenge and tragedy. It rips a hole in the it rips a hole and shows that today's normal is an illusion. And therefore challenges and tragedy have the function of waking us up to see life for what it really is. My friends, we are sleeping. I don't mean to include you in my, in my own musser. <laughs> Mike Stern, you are sleeping. But only when Sion is recaptured, we will realize that we've gotten used to living a life of complacency, a life of mediocrity, a life of a lack of inspired growth, a compromised reality. And when we wake up, it will all have been a dream. And only then, when Sion is redeemed, will our mouths be filled with laughter. But before that, no. Our tongue with glad song. But before that, no. Hashem's presence is missing in our lives. It's missing in Zion. And yet it is normal. It's a normal thing. Hashem wants us to live a normal life. It's like this all crazy to me. 
It's normal to go on with the abnormal life as if this life is normal, but it's not. True normal is God's presence and dominion. Al Naharas Babalo, Babel, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and we wept and we remembered Sion. All over Judaism, we are beckoned to be one of the mourners of Sion and Shalayim. That is the normality of our life. We are taught when a man covers his house, his new house, with plaster, he's got to leave a small little place uncovered, unfinished. His joy of building a new home cannot be complete. If a man prepares all that he wants to with a feast, he should leave something out. If a woman is adorning her woman, if a woman is adorning herself, she must leave out something small. We place ashes on the on the forehead of a chassan. I think most of all, what speaks to this is at our at the wedding, at our wedding, at the time of our greatest personal joy. We step on a glass to remember the destruction of the base of Mignash. At the time of our greatest personal joy. Denise and I, my wife, we had our, we had our chasana at Moshav Ora, outside of the confines of Yushalayim proper, so we could have live music. But in the site of the Makam Migdash, most a lot of post scheme that we know, just a drum, just a drummer. Because joy cannot be complete in this world. There's something more that we are working for. And our joy, when we get married, it cannot be complete. Because the presence, God's presence is not here. Other people are in pain. We even remember that under the chuppah. We cannot forget how to make this, the distinction between the life that we seek, one of peace and love and unity and truth and goodness and righteousness and perfection, and the mundane illusion that we live in. I feel that my wife and I, we've caught up to the true reality that Hashem wants us to understand and know that we are amongst the mourners of Sion and Yishalayim. If I forget you, Yishalayim, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue adhere to its palate. If I fail to elevate Yishalayim above my greatest joy. It is clear that the rabbis intended for the Jewish people to never live a life the same as it was before the destruction. Never to feel unbridled joy never to feel completely comfortable when others are suffering and God's presence is not in the world. And I'm thinking about this, what an expectation, I think this is heavy. I mean, this is God's expectation for us that we should live as a mourner of Tzion Yerushalayim? To always have an aspect of yourself to be real and experience darkness and anguish? and confusion, and a lack of clarity. To live in this world when our holy temple is destroyed, the knowledge of God cloudy, inspiration is stifled, and we can't adequately serve God. And this is God's expectation? Like, wow. But we know, we know that it's only for the sake that we cannot let the world be like this. It is our job to bring Hashem's presence out of exile. Too much pain, too much falsehood, too much illness, too much death. We've got work to do. The world needs God's love and light, care and compassion, truth and unity. This is our job. And like, I don't want this heaviness. Like, I, who, who wants this? I don't want this heaviness. I don't want this intensity. I don't want the responsibility. And the most of all is I don't want to be this awake. But I'm awake now. 
And this is one of the main messages I came to share. That the gift of, sh of the darkness of Shoshi's Patira was the gift of being awake. As painful as it is. And I call it living not at the mundane curtain, but I call it living beyond the curtain. But this mirrors what the Torah says. King Shlomo says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than it is to go to a simcha. My first reaction is, really? I've been to both. But what is he, what is he saying? He's saying there's more reality in the house of mourning. That doesn't mean, mean you're, you're, you're living in mourning. It means the mourning should wake you up. I mean, what are we doing? What are we living for anyway? Errands? I am so sick of errands. I don't know about you, but errands seems to impede in my life about what I'm really concerned about in my life. But it's so, it's so pernicious, though. We, it's a conundrum. We, we, actually, we, le we legitimately have errands. We can't get rid of them. It's like a problem. But there's like schlepping, there's shopping, there's, shopping, there's cooking, there's laundry. There's jo we jobs and we have bills. It's like ridiculous. And, and, and we don't even have enough time for that. And this is like justifiable time we need to spend on things. So I don't have an answer to that. I'm just mesmerized by the fact that at the same time where we're living f for aspirations of our neshama and we've got to take care of all this stuff that seems to take up all of our time. But every once in so often, we get a wake-up call from Hashem. He wakes us up to our lives. Maybe it's an important exam. You have an anniversary coming up, a job interview, a child accomplishes something special, you get a gift of jewelry, and you're in a different dimension already. You're beyond the curtain a little bit. But then the curtain just always turns back. And there's this whole other level of heightened living. They, God forbid, found a spot, God forbid, on the liver. Your mother's been coughing for two months. You don't know why. You have a kid in the ICU. And you're really awake now. God forbid a spouse is abusing another spouse. You undergo a surgery. person gets divorced. The kids don't seem to be following in your path. God's got your attention now. And as painful as it is, and life is painful, but the greatest gift you can get is bring awake. Awake to the preciousness of life. Awake to the preciousness of our moments. God forbid we should need a tragedy or a challenge to awake us to the preciousness of our lives. It's better to learn from somebody else's challenge <laughs> and tragedy. I really felt, and somewhat do feel still, not as much, but like I've been living life behind the curtain. Like the curtain peeled aside and it didn't go back. And in that realm, time seems to slow down. And the clarity of a far bigger picture emerges in my mind on a day-to-day -day basis. That what am I living for? What's life all about? Where am I going? How am I going to get there? Constantly occupied with these kinds of questions. And the deepest realization that to the extent that you realize the preciousness of the moment is to the extent we could live a life with more meaning and more significance on a moment-to-moment, -moment, everyday basis, no matter how old you are. A couple of things really transformed in our home after Shoshi's passing. I would say that, that to some extent, a lot of members in our family 
we're able to truly see a little better, truly experience a little better, truly hear a little bit better, and give, give a little love. This awakeness, colors became more vivid. My kids laugh more funny, and my wife's prettier than ever, and my friends and family more endearing. And I feel one of the things I gained from it, it was being able to focus more on my kids' good things, not be as critical as I might have been before. Because when you're awake, your priorities shift. When you're awake, you have clarity. When you're awake, you have ultimate goals. I think everybody's a little more forgiving in the house for each other's idi idiosyncrasies, faults, and stupidity, which we all have to do in our homes. And I want to share probably one of the most important aspects of this talk that I want to share. It's about Shoshi, my daughter. And a bunch of you in here know her. Um, so you'll know what I'm saying is the truth. But if you ask me a couple of weeks before Shoshi's passing, you would ask me, like, was Shoshi a, a loving, kind person with a good eye? A simchas a chayim? I said, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of course she's all those things. After the fact, when all the election tallies came in during her shiva and beyond, the entire picture of her life added up to one of greatness. She was an unbelievable person. But it was a greatness that I couldn't really see in her life. And it's a lot with all of our kids. Are they, are they good? Yeah, good boy. He's a man. Yeah, he's a man. Yeah, he's a good boy. Yeah, it's sensitive. Yeah, it's good. No, no. Do you really see who your child is? Who you're married to? Not awake enough. Got to play the love game. <laughs> but yeah, she always listened to us. Yes, she was a good girl. She helped us. She made the Pesach desserts. But what an opportunity it was to experience and appreciate her greatness in her lifetime. Being beyond the curtain also gives you an unbelievable opportunity to see God as you never did before. I heard the following from the CEO of Ashitar International. He told me something that Rab Noach Weinberg, who was an Irish yeshiva, quote, he was quoted as saying, after his father had passed away, Rab Noach said, follow the thing, he said, only a mourner can say Kaddish in a proper way. See, Kaddish is entirely a praise of Hashem and not about the deceased. The depth of that is, is that when you're in mourning, you see things for what they are. You, then you can truly praise Hashem. When you become a mourner for Tzion and your Shalayim, or whether it's personal, you're able to see God's hand in everything in your life. And of course, the heightened awareness can work both ways. Fear can paral paralyze you, but being awake can energize you to no end. If I was living a life to change the world, I'm more, more motivated now more than ever. If I was driven by a desire to be good and have meaning in my life, it's more now. And that is what is called living. That's living. Anything short of that, at the end of our lives, we're going to be kicking ourselves for not utilizing the opportunities for greatness that came across our path. Hashem gives us opportunities. He shakes us to be alive and awake and to realize these are all opportunities to embrace the preciousness of our lives.
So now we have a lot of opportunities coming up. The 17th of Tammuz, the three weeks, Tisha B'Av. We have to be thinking here, what can we do here? Let's try to, I'm going to try to bring this down more to a more practical time period in our, in our Jewish calendar. Well, this is the time in the three weeks. Where we're, it's a little different than it is all year round. You know, all year round we console ourselves a lot. We see the glass is half full, not half empty. We look at it as an we look at it as an attitude of gratitude. Oh, I got half full. We overlook lack during the year. If I don't have this, at least I have that. If it's not this way, I have it another way. But I think, and this is Lafiyah and Daiti, my own humble opinion, in the three weeks. It's a time to see it as half empty. Because this is a time to work on the message of being a mourner of Yerushalayim and Sion. Our life is not complete. It should be different. It should be better. And we've got to work towards it. I call it positive dissatis dissatis dissatisfaction to build the base of Mignash. So I'd like to share what would be any rabbi up here would share the same thing as what's the essential lesson that we need to understand and learn for the three weeks and for Tisha B'Av. But it happens to be, it dovetails with what I learned from Shoshi in her life. So let's go back to the root of the problem in the first place and then I'll swing Shoshi back in. The Gemara in Misechta Yoma teaches us the root cause of the current 2,000 year exile the destruction of the base of Migdash, and most importantly, the lack of God's presence in our lives was caused by baseless hatred and created a lack of Jewish unity. Achdus. It's obvious, even though they were observant, Torah observant, Talmidei Chachamim, it's obvious. In the second temple, they must not have cared enough for each other. They must not have respected each other enough, at least what Hashem's expectations were. We must not have realized that our national mission and our national responsibility of being a light to all nations hinges on the fact of how we treated each other. We must not have realized that baseless hatred and lack of Jewish unity undermines our whole entire mission. Because being a light unto the nations starts with being a light unto ourselves and a light to each other. And when we understand that love is all there is and we are united together as a Jewish people, that is what Hashem wants. That's what He's waiting for. Chafetz Chaim teaches us Chafetz Chaim teaches us that which exiled us, the baseless hatred, the lack of Jewish unity, that which exiled us, if not corrected, is preventing us from bringing Mashiach and God's presence. It's not those people in those days that are keeping Mashiach back. It's us. And this understanding was totally illuminated to me by Shoshi's life and she inspired me tremendously in these avenues. It is not a coincidence that my daughter Shoshi died during Sphira. And as you know, Sphira starts the second day of Pesach. We count 50 days into Shavuos. And these days are days of mourning. No haircuts, no marriages, no live music. And we remember the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. And the Gomorrah tells us the calamity they suffered was Shalo Nahugu Kavad Zelazeh. They simply didn't show each other enough respect as much as it was respected, expected of them. They certainly didn't, they just didn't value each other as much as they could in a unique and special way of the neshama of every person. But I think Shoshi's patira during this time pointed us in the direction of how we appreciate and how we respect and how we love one another. 
So let me tell you a little bit about Choshi and the lessons of unity and the lessons of love and the lessons of how we treat each other. One of my rabbis in Boca Raton, Rabbi Rabofsky, his daughter is here, coincidentally. It's nice to hear nice words about your father. But Rabbi Rabofsky eloquently eulogized Shoshi and brought up the most simple but such a deep thing. She said, I drove carpool for Shoshi. And it's a long trip. It's 45 minutes there to base Yaakov in Boca, 45 minutes back. To quote Mrs. Rabofsky, the Rebbitson, Rebbitson said, I love this quote, she said, you never know anybody until you do carpool with them. <laughs> it's a great line. It's true. But Rabbi Rabofsky said, whenever there was somebody unexpected to come into the car, show she would give up her seat. And Rabbi Rabofsky said, I've been driving carpool for a long time. It's a rare trait, let alone for an adult, but for a kid to not be so mockbit on their seat. And that's just the beginning of being a person who doesn't put themselves in the center all the time and can feel so secure about themselves to freely give. If you're secure about yourself, of who you are, you're not thinking about my seat. It's your pleasure. I coined a term at, at her eulogy that shows she really got it. She got the message. The, the, every parent has something they want their child to get and understand. And so she got it already by 12 years old. But what did she get? So she got the thought or the idea, the, the practice of validating, affirming, respecting, and treasuring every person she met. But I want to tell you, it was not a conscious thing. She just was. She just was. It's not something that she thought about. But the way that Shoshi related to everybody is that everybody's created but Selim Elohim. And therefore, there's something to love in everyone. And they are worthy of that love. There was a Misa, this is not in my script, but there was a Misa at Beis Yaakov. Uh, Shoshi was in sixth grade. It was her first year in Beis Yaakov. There was a girl that nobody was really playing with, she wasn't included. Well, show she didn't know enough that she shouldn't include her. She didn't know enough. So show she embraced her. And the rest of the group was like, you can't, you can't include her. And show she was like, if we don't include her, I'm not in. That's it. I mean, but not, she thought about it. It's just who she was. And I got something on Facebook a couple of weeks ago the sixth grade girls that are now eighth grade graduating, a mice that came up, Shoshi's best friend, Basia, Basi, Basi Lyons. So Yael sends me this Facebook thing. Basi is facing the same thing that Shoshi faced two years ago. There's this whole thing, and all the girls, they don't want to include one girl. And Basi came to her older sister, and her older sister said, Basi, what would Shoshi do? Bossy said, either the girl's included or I'm not going. So she still lives on because the impact she made as a sixth grader. But she did. She did. In a world where most people or some people, a lot of the time, they tend to marginalize, criticize, condemn, and gossip about others and try to lift themselves up by putting other people down. For Shoshi, it did not matter how popular you were. It didn't matter how pretty you were. It didn't matter what school you went to. What side of the tracks you lived. How long your skirt was. Shoshi went to Beis Yaakov, i.e., could sit a little more on the right. She went to the, the Bas Mitzvah program at a shul in town considered a little bit to the left of that. She went to a camp with public school kids and Chabad families. And so show, and show she made friends with the non-Jews in the neighborhood. One lady came over during Shiva and said, I know your daughter because she came and bought Passover candy for me. And you know what? Most girls who come buy Passover candy for me, they never come back. 
Shoshi always came back. Because it wasn't about getting the money for the, can for the, for the candy, the, the chocolate. The thing I could be most proud about is who came, who came to pay their respects for the Shiva. This is my, the, I'm, my last name is Stern. This is, this is the Stern family's scorecard of what's important to the Stern family when I tell you who came to Shiva. Bob the bug guy. The African American UPS fellow. The gardener that's not even ours in the neighborhood. The AC guy, <laughs> whoever came across our house, you get caught there. And Shoshi and Devori, my other daughter, are like the front line of that. You can't walk by our house without drink or eat. You just can't do it. But everybody knew Shoshi. Everybody knew her. How do you get to be a girl when you're, you're in sixth grade and 1,500 people come to your Leviah? They shut down I-95 from Boca to North Miami Beach. The last time they did that for was Vice President Joe Biden. A thousand people came to Shiva. And let me tell you, and this is the most, if you didn't hear any, anybody didn't hear anything, this is the thing to hear. This right now, this is the thing to hear. Shoshi was not a Borough Park girl. Not that there's anything wrong with that. She's not an art scroll book waiting to happen. Not that there's anything wrong with that. She wasn't sheltered. She wasn't idle. She wasn't quiet. In fact, Shoshi loves shopping. Shoshi loved Instagram. Shoshi's skirt was creeping up and up and up. <laughs> we lived in Boca. It's a hard place. This is a normal girl. She loved painting her toes. She loved wearing wild colors. She was competitive. I was competitive. So my thought is, if Shoshi can do it, we can do it. If Shoshi can do it, we can do it. That's as simple as that. Without realizing it, Shoshi knew what life was all about how to treat each other. And that is our bottom line, how we treat each other and our Jewish unity. So I just want to wrap it up with how can we maybe take this lesson home in a practical way tonight at Marv. And here's my suggestion. Let's be real when we dive in Shimona Esrei. And I'm really talking to myself. Because unless you're preparing for this, you're not really real with it either. I kind of got back from the other side of the curtain. But when we dive in three times a day, we can go behind the curtain just a little bit. It says in Shimon Esrei, gather our exiles from the four corners of the earth, and you got to mean it, to our lands. May you speedily cause the offspring of your servant to flourish, Mashiach. We hope for your salvation all day long. And to Yerushalayim, your city, may you return with compassion. May you rest within it as you have spoken. May you please rebuild soon as an eternal structure. Turn us away, not empty-handed. Be gracious to us. Answer us. Hear our prayers. Restore the service to the Holy of Holies. May our eyes see your return to Zion. And then we conclude the Shimona Esrei. Please, Almighty, establish for us peace and goodness and blessing and life and graciousness, compassion and kindness upon all of us and upon all your people. But the last thing is our lesson and our goal. Bless us, our Father, as one with the light of your countenance. We have got to be one. And then God willing, Hashem will bless us 
in every season, in every hour, with peace. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and um, I hope that I did my daughter uh, the dignity that's due to her, and I hope I was able to share some thoughts and ideas that can help us live somewhat beyond the curtain and at the curtain. You know, Yaakov's la ja ja Yaakov Avinu's ladder of the Sulam, the dream, the bottom of the ladder is planted in mundane life on the earth, top of the ladder, aspirations for all of our Neshama's aspirations. May we soon see Mashiach in our time.